Hey, welcome everyone. It's great to be with you this morning. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, it's really great to have you here. We always love having new guests. I see a lot of new faces that I don't know. Don't know who I, uh, who I am. My name is Richard and one of the pastors here. And we like to say we're a church of accents. So you're going to hear Canadian, South African, Brazilian, Filipino, and everything else in between. So welcome. It's really great to be with you this morning. We are finishing a uh, sermon series we've been doing through the summer. And um, with the start of the CNE, it feels like the beginning of the end of summer. Am I allowed to say that? No, okay. Um, but it kind of is. Um, and so we've been journeying through Psalm 23. Um, and so we're going to pick up with uh, that and we're going to close it out today. We also have some exciting baptisms today. We have two people going to be taking baptisms today. So we're super excited for that. And. Uh, Following the message, you're going to get to hear their uh, testimony and confession of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be doing it, also having to juggle, because usually we do it in the beautiful courtyard, but the courtyard is also taped off with danger, do not enter. And so we're going to do it out in front there. So lots of changes. But we're going to uh, jump in today, and we're going to be looking at Psalm 23. And so let's read this together. Um, one of the most iconic pieces of poetry uh, written still referenced in modern culture today, movies, songs, and whatnot. So here we go. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray quickly. Father, thank you so much for your word that has eternal meaning and power. And so we ask Jesus, by your spirit, would you come and bring your word to life in our lives, God? Meet us where we're at, but don't leave us where we're at. And so we ask you, great teacher, Holy Spirit, come and, and open up these truths, open up scripture to us, uh, that we may think differently, feel differently, and live differently in light of it. For your glory, our joy. Amen. So uh, we've been journeying through this, and so how I want to end uh, this today is to really look at Psalm 23 as a pilgrimage, as a, as a journey, if you will. Now, many of us, most of us, not an agricultural kind of uh, settings, and so sometimes we've talked about how the shepherd sheep metaphor can get a little bit lost on us modern urbanites, but um, sheep are entirely dependent upon the shepherd to lead them well. And so um, in some ways, this has all been about a journey of sheep going on a journey through green pastures, quiet streams, through some dark valleys, the enemies around, even death lurking, and now eventually they kind of come home to the, the house of the Lord forever. And so in some ways it mimics life, everything in life, the highs, the lows, the dangers, the delights. And so I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the journey, of a journey toward flourishing. Now, um, a while back I read an article called From Languishing to Flourishing. It was kind of as uh, society was emerging from the pandemic and they'd noticed a lot of people, uh, if you have it on a scale of, of chronic depression to flourishing, a lot of people were kind of just in there, like blah, stagnant or stuck, and they, they termed that languishing. I know many of you in this church uh, would describe yourself as languishing, perhaps still feel like that might be your case. And so we're gonna be looking at what does it mean to flourish? Because this really is a journey toward flourishing. Now, human flourishing, in his book, Flourishing, Miroslav Volf, the um, Croatian theologian, uh, highlights the importance of this idea, this concept of human flourishing. It's been around for a while. Um, every individual wants to live the best life possible, right? Everyone wants to not just survive, they want to thrive, they want to flourish. But what exactly is it to flourish? And this is where it gets interesting, because we all have different ideas of what flourishing looks like. If you turn on your TV, if you go to your social media, if you look at your friends, if you go to this people, that people, everyone's going to have a different idea of what it means to live the good life, to live the life of flourishing. 
What was interesting in his book is he traces basically the three phases of this idea of flourishing to the modern age. And so I'm going to take a lot of pages and summarize them for you very quickly. But the first idea was flourishing was to love God and to love neighbor and to enjoy doing that. And so obviously it gets its grounding in it. it, it most of the major religions, not just Christianity, most of the major religions would echo this. It's to have a God-centered life. That's what it means to flourish. God, the source of all that is true, all that is good, all that is beautiful, is the, the center. Then he, he marks a significant change around about the 18th century to where the idea of a transcendent God was not necessary towards human flourishing, but we kept the human connection, the moral, um, uh, the moral call to, to look after one another, and this is termed universal beneficence. So in other words, it becomes kind of a new humanism where now no longer is flourishing requires to have a God center or even a God belief, we are at the center if we want to flourish. And so the individual flourishes is tied to the everyone flourishing, and everyone flourishing is tied to the individual. Marxism, all of these kind of things came out of that idea. But then there was another phase, the phase that we kind of have in terms of the West here, is that of experiential satisfaction. In other words, to flourish, I am at the center and it's chasing after satisfaction and experience. And you can do that in any myriad of ways, whether it's career, pleasure, whatnot. And so that's where we find ourselves today. To flourish, I want to be happy. I want to be successful. I want to be satisfied. And that looks different for all of us. Now, another way to look at that, now that was a very simplified, but a very complex thing, but that was a very simplified look. But another way to look at that is to see how our love has been misdirected and curved inward, right? Our love, now, humans need to love. It's a necessity of being human, is to love and to be loved. And so you don't stop loving, you just direct to different things. Mm -hmm. And so what we can see over the trace of that, and what flourishing typically was centered and directed towards God, and then from God towards one another, quickly evolved to just turn it towards one another, and now it's curved inward on ourselves. And so in another sense, we've diminished the object of our love, and we suffer for it. And we wonder why we don't get that satisfaction, even though we chase after it. We wonder why success doesn't quite bring us a satisfaction, or always a little bit more is needed. And that is our problem. He goes on to say this, whatever we have, we want more and different things. And when we have climbed to the top, a sense of disappointment clouds the triumph. Our striving can therefore, uh, can therefore find proper rest only when we find joy in something infinite. In other words, joy in something beyond just us, beyond just this. And so if we are created by God and created for God, it makes sense that our journey needs to start with Him if we want to find the flourishing that our soul needs. So to be human is to love, but human flourishing is to love the right things in the right order. So let's get back to sheep and shepherd and sheep flourishing. So it's interesting that the person who wrote this was King David. He was a shepherd that became the king of Israel. And it's interesting that he writes it not in the posture of a shepherd, but in the posture of a sheep. That he looks to his Lord as the great shepherd of his soul. Now, the shepherd, shepherd sheep metaf metaphor or motif, if you will, um, can sometimes be an offense to our modern sensibilities. Sheep are not the cleverest of animals, kind of a herd mentality cuts against everything of the autonomy and the independence that modern day uh, is valued so much. But the sheep are entirely dependent on the shepherd, on the shepherd's competence and the shepherd's character. You can have a bad shepherd that's not gonna lead you into great places, you can have a good shepherd. And so here's what we're getting at, is we all have a shepherd in life. It just is a question of who or what is it. We are all looking to something to get us through we are all looking to something for the good life or flourishing. We may name it different things, but we all have that within us. We all need and have a shepherd to get us through life 
and flourish. And so David's posture is one of humility, it's one of dependence, it's one of confidence, and ultimately one of trust in the Lord as his shepherd. Now those are words that are very challenging for us today, particularly with trust. Some barriers to trusting God, to trusting something infinite, something transcendent, something beyond, cuts against our rational, scientific way of looking at life. A couple of reasons why there might be some barriers towards you and our flourishing through trust in God. Firstly is deceit. Deceit deceit is very uh, tricky because deceit is not the same as lying, right? Deceit smells and looks very closely like the truth. It's just concealed or misrepresented a little bit. But it's got enough of the truth there that it could be true, but it's not quite fully the truth, if you get what I'm saying. And so uh, Dallas Willard talks about this. He says, if it, on his commentary on his book on Psalm 23, he says, we are, if we are to know the abundant provision of God's unlimited resources, a life of flourishing, if you will, we must also understand how Satan works to rob us of that experience. And he does so by deceit. And if you know the story well, our very first parents, Adam and Eve, experienced this. He didn't come with a blatant line. He said, did God really say this? He actually quoted back to them what God said, but not fully what God said. Enough of what God said that it was kind of recognizable, but it was a little bit off. And that's often the modus operandi. You want to be happy? This is going to bring you happiness. You want love, this is going to bring you love. You want to be loved, this is what you need to be or do. And it's just such a little bit of a tweak. The second barrier towards us trusting God is not just through deceit, but control. We want control of our life. We want control of the outcomes of our life. We want control of the timing of our life. I should be married by now with 2.5 kids. Right with the picket fence and the, whatever it is, and we also want to have control of certain areas of life. God, I'll give you this, this, and this, but my sexuality, oh no, that's uh, it's reserved for something else. God, I want to give you this, this, and this, but my career and my commitment to achieving whatever costs, that's mine. I'm all in onto that, and so control gets in our way of having the posture of David, humility, dependence, confidence, and trust in God. So our journey toward flourishing. So Psalm 23 is a challenge to every single one of us to ask the question, what does flourishing look like to you? Does it look like humility, dependence, confidence, and trust in God as your ultimate shepherd? Or does it look like something else? Who are you and I listening to to attain the life of flourishing? Secondly, it's not just a journey toward flourishing. It's a journey toward home. And this is where we focus on the last verse. Throughout the series, we've been looking at each verse and picking apart. And so today we look at that last verse. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Have you ever been homesick? Anyone been homesick? Even adults can get homesick. You know, actually, for a lot of us, we're Canada. We We weren't born in Canada, so home is somewhere else sometimes in the world. And I know sometimes newcomers, they come to the city and this is exciting and then it kind of wears off the novelty and you kind of then begin to miss some comforts from home, right? I remember I was about 13 and I was, um, I was, I think I was doing scouts at that time and we were doing a seven, seven night camp. My parents drove, put me in the car and we drove two hours to the campsite and it was really exciting, and then it was time for the parents to go, and they got in their cars, and they drove back, and then it dawned on me for the next seven days, I'm in this tent with these people, and I was so homesick. I missed home so much. Have you ever had that experience? Maybe as a parent, you've seen your kid have homesickness, and it's just like, oh, it's terrible. So homesickness is an experience of both distress from the absence of the comforts of home, and also longing, right? It's a longing for home. And in a very real way, we could describe the human condition without God as homesickness, as an anxiety, a distress that you're not quite where you should be, and a longing for something that maybe you can't even articulate, but drives us forward. That longing, that striving drives us forward 
in a different way. It's how we build lives apart from God and we wonder why we don't flourish or we wonder why we don't have quite the contentment because there's a homesickness. Our home is meant to be with God. But when we reject or um, walk away from Him, we experience that homesickness. So now in this verse, he talks about the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord. Now in verse 6 captures the end of the journey. He comes to dwell. I want to to dwell forever. I'm going to live forever. I'm going to be forever with God. Now, we know that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, right? So it sounds a bit weird to say, well, we're with God right now. There's no place you can go in this world, not even in this universe where God isn't, right? So we know that aspect, that God is everywhere. But there's a different aspect of God's presence that's much more manifest and tangible than just knowing that God is there. It's kind of like being in your house and knowing somebody else is there, right? But maybe you're not in the same room. You're aware of their presence, but their presence is not really impacting your life versus having lunch face-to-face with that person in the same house. And so that's what we're talking about here. It's not just an awareness that God is kind of, but like the house of the Lord coming in and having fellowship, dinner, uh, intimate conversation, relationship with Him. God's house, typically, um, if you chart it through uh, the Old Testament and into the New Testament, is pretty neat. So God creates the world. He creates a garden. He puts mankind in this garden. And His presence, it says that, that, that mankind was walking with God in this garden. Right? Not just God there, God intimately. That's created for that. We're created by God, for God, to be with God. Right? That's where home is for your soul and my soul. Tragically, through our sin, we get alienated and separated from God from home. And so God, instead of abandoning that, He said, Okay, I can't dwell with you like I need to because you are sinful. But what I'm going to do is establish me a tent. And we'd have this tent of meeting. And there would be this holy tent. And they had all these things to access the holy presence of God. And then eventually they took it from a tent. They built what was called a temple. And even in the temple was images of the garden to remind you that that's where we're supposed to be dwelling with God. But because of our sin, we can't access God. And then... Many hundreds of years later, Jesus comes up on the scene and he says, no, no, God's not confined to temples. He becomes the manifest presence of God. It says that he walks around. He becomes the presence of God for us. He goes to the cross. He dies. He, he's resurrected. The temple curtain is torn. God's presence is now freely available to anyone everywhere through Jesus Christ. And then Jesus tells those that follow him, hey, you're the temple now. You, 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 you. You get to host and carry the presence of God. And then right at the end of the story, Revelation 21 verse 3 says this incredible thing. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with mankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That's how we began. That's where we're going. Home is where God is. Home is where flourishing is. I want to nerd out on you a bit because this is really cool. I don't know Hebrew. Many of you may not know Hebrew either. We call this series, He Restores Restore My Soul. In verse 3, it says, He Restores My Soul. And we looked at that word, restore. And it's this idea of turning or returning or turning back or returning, right? It is now the same Hebrew word that shows up in verse 6, only it's not now, uh, it's not now translated restore, it's translated dwell. And it's dwell in verse 6 is the same Hebrew word that's translated restore in verse 3. And so in essence, it means to turn back or return. And so restoration or flourishing would be another word for that. Restoration flourishing has something to do, to do with dwelling. And dwelling has something to do with us turning and returning where? Home. Returning back to who we were created for. And in that, finding our restoration. In that, finding our flourishing. And so in other words, the journey toward flourishing is a journey toward home, and the journey toward home is a returning to God himself. Dallas Willard continues on his commentary 
uh, with this. He says, the experience of a life without lack or flourishing depends first and foremost upon the presence of God in our lives because the source of this life is God himself. The gospel that Jesus himself proclaimed, manifested, and taught was about more than his death for the forgiveness of our sins, as important as that is. It was about the kingdom of God, God's immediate availability, his with usness, that makes a life without lack possible. There is so much more to our relationship with God than just his dealing with our guilt and sin. Once we have been forgiven, we are meant to live in the fullness of the life that Jesus came to give us. I have come that they may have life and life abundantly. That sounds like flourishing to me. And it's connected to Jesus, who's connected to the presence of God, who's connected to where home is for us. So you want flourishing? We want a home? It's connected to our relationship with God. It's as simple and as beautiful and also as complex as that. And so living the fullness of life is connected not to techniques, not to this or that, not to principles. It's connected firstly to a person. Now, hundreds of years later, after this Psalm 23 was penned, Jesus comes on the scene and he identifies himself as the shepherd of that psalm. In fact, he says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. I am the good shepherd. I lay my life down for the sheep. So a life of flourishing is following the good shepherd. But we get the benefit of seeing a fuller picture than David saw when he was painting that. It's Jesus Christ. It's humility, dependency, confidence, and trust in Jesus Christ to bring you home and to bring you to flourishing. So firstly, it's a person, it's Jesus. Secondly, it's a posture. It's a posture of trust in Jesus. And it's trust in Jesus in every area, right? Do you know that there's areas in your life it's easy to trust God in, right? Like my future salvation, like heaven sounds like a good deal compared to the other place. But there's other places a little bit harder. Think about socially, relationally, Vocationally, what you do for work, financially, recreationally, sexually, all the different things that make up your my life. Which area is it hard right now for you to trust him in? And that might be the area that if you trust him and depend upon him and look to him in humility, you'll experience a flourishing that maybe you haven't yet experienced by coming into a posture of trust, of humility. So it's a person. Living a flourishing life is connected to a person. Living a flourishing life is connected to a posture towards that person of trust, humility, confidence, dependency. And then thirdly, it's connected to practices, daily, regularly, intentional practices that put us before this person, that put us in the presence of this abundant life that we're hearing about. You know, you can't drift into a life of flourishing. You can't drift into a relationship with God. It takes intentionality. You can't drift into love with my wife. It takes intentionality and actions to do that. And so what would it look like in your life and in my life if personally you intentionally sought God more than you did yesterday? And then tomorrow you'll seek God more than you did today. And that you created space in your areas of life to say, God, I want you to come into this area of my life. I want you to shape this area of my life where it's not lined up, where it's not going to flourish because I'm trying to do it. I'm trying to take control. I want to release the reins of my life in this area to you. What would it look like if we intentionally had that posture regularly, every day? What could God do in your life and in my life? What could God do through your life and my life with that kind of posture following that kind of good shepherd who only wants you to come home and flourish. Mm. And yes, even though we walk through dark places, yes, that psalm speaks to the reality of life. We're not yet are we in the fullness where God's dwelling will be forever. And we look forward and long for that day. But even still, even though I walk, why? I'm not going to fear. I'm not going to be anxious. I'm not going to be, why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
community as well. It's not just an individual effort. You know, when we gather like this, this is so pleasing to God because God said in Ephesians 2, it tells us that Jesus is building us together into a dwelling. Is that word? Dwelling house, dwelling place for God by His Spirit. And I just want to tell you what you're doing is so very countercultural. Because everything is about my journey, my spirituality, my individualism. And this is hard, right? It is easy to wake up and put on your laptop or your TV and watch your favorite church service somewhere out there. Okay? We did that for two years. I'm not mocking that. But that's not church. This church is the people. Jesus isn't connecting laptops together. Saying, there's my house, there's my presence. No, he's connecting people together. And people are difficult. You're difficult. I am difficult. You're hard to work with and live with. I'm hard to work with. Well, maybe I'm not, am I? Maybe. <laughs> Speak to my wife about that one. And that's, that's beautiful. That's how we're supposed to be. Jesus experienced it. He had 12 disciples. And honestly, they could not get along. They bumped heads. They had different people with different political views, different ideologies, A-type personalities, they're introverts, they're extroverts. Could you imagine? It's been exhausting being in a group with Peter. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and it's beautiful because it worked. And the only reason it worked is because of the good shepherd, Jesus. And that's the testimony. When you and I bring this together, and we have different accents, different nations, different backgrounds, tastes. When we say, you know, we could sleep in and it's a beautiful day, we could go out to the beach, it's summer, we the sea and we say, no, we prioritize this. That is so radically countercultural. And it's so good for us. Yeah. And so we're going to go back into a song, and I'm going to finish off with a scripture. And uh, this is a scripture I think um, encapsulates our response today. And it's one of many scriptures I could have used because this is a language God uses, particularly in the Old Testament, again and again and again. He tells his people, return to me. Why? Because we're prone to wander, right? Prone to wander individually, prone to wander collectively. And again and again, he says, return to me. And then through Jesus Christ, that's his message, return to me because me is home. Me is home for your soul. What your soul is longing for if you really get down to it, I can tell you what it is. It's longing for that connection with God that we had in the beginning in the Garden of Eden that now gets, gets us connected back through Jesus Christ and we long for its fullness one day. When in Revelation 21 it says, my dwelling place will be with you and you with me and I'm going to be your God, the good shepherd forever. Joel chapter 2, yet even now says the Lord, return to me with all your heart. With fasting, with weeping and with sorrow, fear, Tear your hearts and light your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. I don't know where you are at, but those are some really great characteristics. Are very patient, ready to forgive. Have you blown it big time? Ready to forgive. Compassionate, he gets you. Compassionate. He feels empathy towards you. He's not just aloof. He gets you. He loves you. And merciful. And so, Father, we do want to respond today. And we do want to come home. Because we want to flourish. We want to live the best life possible. And while so many different narratives out there on what the best life possible looks like god we see in psalm 23 that this is the best life possible to have a posture of trust in our good shepherd jesus christ that he will lead us to green pastures quiet waters and yes even though we may walk through darkness even though we may be surrounded by our enemies we will not fear because you are with us your rod your staff they comfort us and so, Father, where we have drifted, where we are prone to drift away from you, maybe just in one particular area of our life, God, we want to return home today. We want to come back and be restored and dwell with you and in doing so experience the flourishing and abundant life that you promised for us. And so, Jesus Christ, would you meet every single person where they're at, but would you not leave them where they're at here today for your glory and our joy? Amen.